Hey. Yeah. What? Grab your bootstraps. Yeah, let's scale your growth. Here's the truth, Jack. We'll reach the globe, unveil the nuts. Daniel, what the fuck? Earn your digits. Boom, burn, you'll get it. See, this is factual. Funds will show. Learn to fool with candid capital. This is a candid capital interview. In these episodes, we host industry business professionals involved in the global tech ecosystem to discuss various topics related to tech, global economy, and building sustainable businesses and investments. Welcome to the Candid Capital Podcast. We are back here in Brazil at the Rio Web Summit, not only to feed my obsession with good food, sunshine, but also candid conversations on tech and innovation. This episode will cover the Brazilian crypto ecosystem, and today we have Aaron Stanley, the founder and publisher of the Brazil Crypto Report, and he also works with the Filecoin Foundation. He is one of the influential voices for the Web3 here in Brazil. Uh, welcome, Aaron. Thanks, Josh, for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, no, I'm super excited to, to talk with you. I've been uh, following your crypto report as uh, it's been one of my uh, obsessions in Web3 for the, for the last year. Nice. So uh, I had to make sure that we could connect um, on this trip. Amazing. So uh, we, we, what I'd like to start with is the or origin story. How did you get into crypto and Web3? Yeah, so um, my initial origin story was, so I was living in Washington, D.C. for about 10 years, uh, and I was working uh, for the Financial Times, actually. I was, I was a, a journalist there in the Washington Bureau, and in about 2013, uh, a friend of mine who was, uh, she was like a kind of a high-ranking staffer on Capitol Hill uh, for like a congresswoman, and she actually quit her job there to go take the communications director role at the Bitcoin Foundation. And I don't know if you remember the, the Bitcoin Foundation, but it had sort of a, a six-month run of glory before uh, most of its like founding members got arrested for various things, and it, it's <laughs> kind of imploded fairly quickly. But... Uh, but the point of the story is she, so she took this job and she's like, Aaron, you need to write a story about Bitcoin. I'm like, Bitcoin, I've heard of this thing, right? Uh, so anyway, so I, I, you know, she introduces me to some people, some experts. I talked to some of these folks. I'm like, oh, wow, this is, this is pretty interesting, right? Wrote a couple articles about it. Uh, didn't, you know, the next few years, like, I think that was right around the time, like, Mt. Gox happened and it looked like everything was kind of dead. And uh, the next couple of years, didn't really pay much attention to it. Uh, and then I get another call in, I think it was like August 2016. I got kind of a call out of the blue from, uh, I wasn't working at FT anymore, but my old editor at FT called and he's like, hey, can you write a story about the, uh, the Winklevoss twins Bitcoin ETF? Uh, and, you know, they were, they were in the process of applying for a Bitcoin ETF at that time. They were the, the first ones to do that in the U.S. So I'm like, oh, sure, sounds interesting. You know, the Winklevoss twins, these kind of, uh, you know, kind of like Harvard jock, like meathead type guys, you know, like expectations weren't super high for that story, but I, I talked to the Winklevoss twins, interviewed these guys, and they, they kind of like red-pilled me. On, I was like, wow, like this is actually, like I think these guys actually are onto something, you know? Um, so I uh, ended up writing an article that, you know, that article came out, and then after that it was, I started getting, you know, lots of just uh, like inbounds, for, like, you know, love mail, hate mail from people, like, you know, criticizing my story or loving my story or whatever. I was like, huh, maybe there's something here I should be paying attention to because I've never, in all my years of being a journalist, I'd never gotten that type of reception on an article before. Um, you know, like good and both negative and positive, right? But the fact is like there's a lot of energy. People are really passionate about this. Like, hmm, maybe I should start looking into this a bit more. Well, before social media, hate used to be a signal of good peace. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So and then um, so I started just trying to look into you know blockchain and crypto a bit more, take a bit more of a, a deep dive into it. I ended up uh, actually writing for CoinDesk at the beginning of the the 2017 kind of ICO wave. Like I still remember, you know, talking to my editor. He was like, "Hey, can you write a story about this ICO?" I'm like, "What the heck is an ICO?" And then by the end of 2017, it was like you know ICOs everywhere, and you know it's just kind of this mania, right? And um, so I've basically been in, in crypto in various capacities ever since. I, I, I spent some time in 2018 at a startup that, that you know, had, did an ICO and then, you know, didn't succeed like most ICO startups, but, you know, learned a lot through the process. Uh, and I'm going back to Coindesk to work at, uh, uh, on, the, on the event side. So doing, like producing consensus and all of our other events that we would do. Uh, so did that for about three, four years, uh, which was a lot of fun, but, um, you know, a little bit like trauma-inducing sometimes, but, but it was quite fun. 
And uh, a couple of years later, I, I made the jump to Filecoin Foundation, wanted to just try something new, work on a, on a project. And I spun up Brazil Crypto Report as kind of as, you know, as a side hustle, I guess, so just as kind of an idea. Um, I was, I'm really into this idea of like skill stacking, right, where you just take things that you're good at and you just kind of combine them together and see if you can create some value out of that. So in my case, it's like, okay, I know about crypto. Uh, I know about, uh, you know, journalism and content creation and narratives and all these things. And I'm also, I'm married to a Brazilian, like I can speak Portuguese reasonably well. Uh, so I have this, this sort of, this trifecta. And I noticed that there was really no English language content about the Brazilian market really at all in, you know, around like 2021. And I was like, well, for a market of this size, 200 million people, it's like, you know, the seventh or eighth largest economy in the world. For there to be like really no information about this at all in English language, it seems like there's probably an opportunity here. So I just sort of started, you know, started this project on a whim. And, um, and it, it's, I like to joke, it's like, okay, now that, like, I can't really stop doing it because like people keep reading it. <laughs> so I can't, like, I can't like really quit now, you know, cause there's a lot of people that, that follow me and, and, and rely on the information that I put out. So it's a lot of like, it's a, it's, I do a lot of news aggregation and then um, I do, I'll do a lot of analysis on some things that come out, you know, whether news events or regulatory issues. Um, try to do like kind of deep dives where it's appropriate. And then I also have a podcast too. So I put out uh, a podcast once a week, you know, interviewing somebody different from the ecosystem um, really trying to capture, um, you know, a variety of different uh, people with different, you know, skin in the game in the Brazilian ecosystem. So whether it's like a Brazilian project or it's a, a foreign company that's looking to enter Brazil or it's just a Brazilian person who's doing something interesting in crypto uh, or just some kind of tie. It has to be like some kind of tie to Brazil, basically, but really just trying to highlight, um, you know, some of the creativity and the developments in this ecosystem. And I've also been expanding to do a bit more of like LATAM coverage as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a little bit harder for me because I'm not really um, like I'm more of a Brazilianist than I am like a Latin Americanist, I guess. Uh, so I don't know as much about the Spanish speaking countries just because I just haven't really focused that much on those areas. But uh, I have a friend who is in Bogota and she, she she used to actually work at the block. She was like the Latin America editor at the block. Um, and she's she's pretty plugged into the region and some of the and she speaks Spanish and everything. So she's pre pretty plugged into the region. So she's been helping me cover a bit more of what's happening um, in the Spanish-speaking countries. So I've been putting out kind of periodic reports on what's happening uh, across uh, the Spanish-speaking countries. And then also now with Argentina, with Millet, there's a lot more interest, I think, just among the crypto community generally in, in, um, in Argentina right now. So I've been trying to put a bit more content on Argentina just because people are, are interested. Well, I think in Latin that. America is going to be very interesting uh, for crypto. Uh, Bitcoin as well. Um, you know ninth largest uh, for crypto market, I believe Brazil is. But what I found was interesting is that, you know, the usage of Bitcoin is still larger than El Salvador, but El Salvador is kind of the loud noise for it. Yeah. And then, of course, you have Argentina coming on. So I think there's a lot of interesting excitement, um, at least in the space for now. Yeah, well, you have, you in Latin America, you have uh, basically all you have this this myriad of very interesting use cases for crypto. Like El Salvador, you have kind of this, you know, techno libertarian, you know, state 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 driven adoption, I guess you could call it. Um, and I think, you know, like I'm not like a Bukele like shill or anything, but I, I I think like directionally he's going like the the vision he has is like directionally correct, right? I I think some of the decisions he's make he's he's made on like how to get there or perhaps not correct. I don't necessarily agree with, but I think directionally, like if, if Bitcoin goes where we, where we think it's going to go in 20 years, like El Salvador is going to be like the richest country in the planet, you know, <laughs> but, you know what I mean? It's like, if he's right and like, we're all right, like then, okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like you said, like adoption hasn't actually been like, there's been a lot of like fits and starts with actually getting people to use adopt, like use these wallets and use Bitcoin and get, you know, but I think directionally they're going the right way. Uh, but so, so it's an interesting case study of, okay, can, can you kind of like force adoption in a country uh, through these this kind of like techno you techno libertarian means I guess one uh, thing for there is what makes it unique is that the alternative doesn't really work yeah well, well. well it's, yeah, cause, so, okay, cause they have nothing to lose right yeah. so it's like well you don't have a currency anyway so you're just yeah. using dollars so like what do you got to lose right yeah if, if you're already at the bottom then yeah you know. and I think and I think that's that you have that same kind of situation in Argentina where uh, you had it's like well you got nothing else to lose so you might as well just try something um 
and um, and obviously, you know, now in Argentina, the last few months since Millet came in, the 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 devaluation of the peso seems to have at least leveled off a bit. Um, so maybe the situation isn't quite as acute as it was, but um, but I think obviously you had a lot of people in Argentina that were using crypto out of necessity as a as an inflation hedge. You had you know people who are using you know, basically taking their their paychecks in direct deposits into like Repio or the crypto exchange, and they just converts into USDT or into Bitcoin right on the spot, mm-hmm. right? So like the the idea is like I just want to hold on to these pesos as little as possible, like just to convert that stuff instantly. So you have people using it out of necessity. Um, you have the remittance use case, which is really big in places like Mexico and and um, uh, and, and Colombia. Somebody was telling me the other day that uh, I don't know if this is true or not, but like ten percent of the remittance flow from Mexico to the, from U.S. to Mexico is is like on like Bitso's rails now. It's something like four billion dollars a year in remittances that are going on on crypto rails. I'm not entirely sure if that's true or not, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't doubt it, I guess. I mean, I, I don't have any reason to say, like, I don't... But anyway. But I think the, the point being is that the remittance use case is, is a strong one in those countries. And then, um, you know, Venezuela, a country like Venezuela, which is sort of, like, unfortunately, uh, a kind of a failed state right now. Um, we don't really know exactly... You can't really trust anything that comes out of Venezuela and the information. So it's kind of hard to... See. You hear all these things anecdotally about people using crypto and people mining Bitcoin and people using Dash to pay things. So you hear these things anecdotally, but it's kind of hard to really, I think we know that it's being used, but we don't, it's hard to know exactly like who's using it for what, right? If that makes sense, just because you can't really trust the sources of information out of that, that country, unfortunately. Um, and lastly, you have Brazil, which is an example of, okay, maybe a place that isn't really suffering from hyperinflation and the econ- the, the macroeconomic scenario is relatively stable. Right, uh, but we've we've had mac, mac, we've had runaway inflation here. I mean, if you're you know if you're 30 years older or older, you've gone through it. Yeah, someone showed me the uh, inflation tracker for the last 20, 20, 25 years. Yeah, it's, I, was, I was shocked it's, at, at like how, how how much it jumped up and down. Yeah, well, it's it's been like periods. I mean, it's been the the you know the the boil the frog in the boiling water type of inflation rather than like you know it's been steadily high like you know high single digits generally i think over the last 30 years which is you know it's not a hundred percent per year but it's but if you compare like okay you know when the real was first launched in well like 94 it was paired to the dollar and now we're at you know now it's obviously like you know a lot less than that right it's, i think it's like you know five and a half or five and a quarter now um so it's obviously they've lost a lot of purchasing power you know just internally within the country and also vis-a-vis the dollar as well so the inflation is there but it's not as like acute i guess yeah. it's not as like it's not like a runaway tra- freight train inflation it's just like it's enough where like if you're not really paying attention you don't really notice it but then you wake up you're like wow this you know this like uh this 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 food that i used to buy is now you know twice what it was when it you know a year ago or whatever you finally you, you slowly realize that, like oh the prices are going up right but you don't necessarily notice it on a day-to-day basis so that's kind of i think that's kind of the inflation that folks are grappling with here but so people aren't necessarily like there's not this acute need to just get out of the rail and into u.s dollars right so so crypto becomes more really more of like a uh you know kind of a part of your an asset that's part of your investment portfolio or um or or another means right so and also you have here you have picks also so you don't really need crypto payment solutions because picks is already about you know it's sort of the easiest probably you know easy it's like the easiest way to send money i've ever used in my life right um it's it's just like you scan a qr code and then boom like the money's over the money is transferred uh and so it's basically like a public utility here for sending money um free so you don't really have this uh, acute need of like being able to send money. Um, I mean, cross border. That's that's that, that's a different story. But Brazil really isn't really like a huge remittance country, and um, the cross border payments. I mean, cross border payments is a thing, but it's not like something that everyday people are like grappling with on a daily basis. So, what speaking. what are you anticipating to be the uh, the Brazilian use case that maybe takes off for? the blockchain yeah well, well what people are really excited about here is is the drex project the the central bank uh central bank of brazil has been working on this kind of cbd like a hybrid cbdc uh smart contract tokenization platform or environment essentially so that's what people here are pretty excited about because the 
there's a number of reasons this is interesting. Um, and there's another, there's a number of reasons why I, I would I mean, I'll, I'll kind of argue like the, I'll, I'll do kind of like the pros and the cons of it, I guess. Um, I think it's interesting because you like just the language that the, that the, the officials out of the central bank are using is stuff that it's language that, like you wouldn't expect. You expect to hear that at a crypto conference, but not at like out of coming from a central bank governor of a G20 country, right? Where he's like, they're talking about, oh, we're trying to like move our financial system to like a tokenized Ethereum virtual machine compatible like blockchain environment. Like that's something you'd hear at a crypto conference, but not at like, you know, the governor of a central bank say that, right? So just the fact that they're talking about this is like, okay, like they actually understand these concepts, right? Uh, if you talk to the, you know, the team members that were involved in the Drex project, it's very clear that these guys are very well studied and they've, they've spent a lot of time really thinking deeply about, okay, what would like, a, what would a financial, like a smart contract based financial system actually look like, right? Like what, would, what is, what is required to build this out? Um, so they've spent a lot of time thinking about this and, um, and then th- they've here to, up to this point, they've, I don't want to say they've delivered, but they've, they've got a pilot that's live. Uh, pretty much every bank, major bank in the, in the, um, in Brazil is like actively using, or they're participating in the pilot, I should say, which is, which is a huge, um, accomplishment just getting, because these are, this is going to be the resistance, right? The, the, the traditional financial system is going to be like kind of the resistance to this sort of thing, right? So that I feel like the central bank has got, has figured out the right method of, the right, the, the, the right kind of like carrot and stick type of approach to getting, it's the same way they did with picks. Like the banks didn't really want to, I mean, that's it's eating into their payment fees. So they didn't really want to, they didn't really like, it's not really in their best interest to just enable picks, right? But the, the bank was able to use, like a kind of a carrot and stick approach to get these guys to go along with it. So are the fintech companies more open to it than the traditional banks then? Well, I think everybody's open to it now. I mean, I I think that's what's interesting is that the market seems um, very like excited about participating in this, right? They're not being, they're not being like dragged along kicking and screaming. They're actually excited about being involved uh, in the, in the directs uh, environment. So uh, I was talking to uh, Fabio Arujo, who's the, I'm the directs coordinator at the central bank. I had him on my podcast a few months ago and he was explaining how uh, around last year on this time, they had put out a call for basically, you know, people to apply to be a part of the Drex pilot that they were launching. Right. And they had room for, you know, maybe like eight to 10 consortia to participate in this pilot. And they had, they received, I think they received more than like 30 or 40 applications for, so they actually had to expand the pool the expand the pilot just to accommodate some additional entrance into this. So he was like, he was like, we got way more applications than we expected of banks and consortiums that wanted to participate in this, in this pilot project. So he was surprised uh, at the, how well received this project actually was like it, it was, people were excited about being involved in this. They weren't, they weren't just kind of like, well, we, you know, we're doing this cause we have to, they were, they were doing it because they were excited about it. So I think that's pretty interesting. Um, and um, I, I think that kind of, it seems to be like the zeitgeist of the market right now is the, the banks are ready. They're, they're all staffing up. They've got blockchain teams. Um, I think there's still a lot of like operational questions that need to be kind of figured out, um, you know, both in the terms of the design of the project, the Drex project, and also, you know, how, what, what, what is the role of the banks going to actually be? What is like, how does this ultimately impact like end customers? There's a lot of unknowns with this. Right. And if like at, at this point, the Drex Drex is kind of like a Rorschach test. And it's like if you ask anybody like 10 different people, you get like 10 different answers of what it is. <laughs> right. It's like, you know, it's got everyone kind of puts their own little spin on it. Right. And I think um, so there's still there's still a lot, a lot, a lot that has to be defined. But I think that's why a lot of people are interested in it. Like a lot of the VCs and stuff are taking a keen interest in it because they see like this is kind of once well, like, once we get to the point where there's a bit more maturity and clarity about what this is. Um, there's going to be a lot of other opportunities that open up. Um, so people are really trying to kind of front run that opportunity. Like how could, like, you know, creating sandboxes and creating projects that like, okay, you know, we're going to create kind of our own like parallel direct system, try to spin up a project, a tokenization project or a new financial product. And then if it works in the sandbox, like we'll, we'll, we'll deploy it like in the direct environment once the direct environment is live essentially. So there's a lot of that kind of like positioning going on. Um, so if you talk to like, you know, the VCs and the builders, that's definitely what people are, are excited about here. Um, and I think what's, what the secret sauce of the Drex um, 
uh, uh, when I say Drex, basically just think like digital real, right? Like, but they, they came up with the word Drex for it. Um, it stands for something. I can't remember exactly what it stands for. To be honest, There's, it's an acronym that stands for something. I can't remember. But they 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 changed the name from digital real to Drex. Um, but the idea is it's a wholesale CBDC, um, where you know there's a there's a closed network of of banks, financial institutions within the central banks, essentially you know their their kind of network, right? Um, and every in each bank will basically be every bank kind of functions as almost like a like a layer two or like a roll up where they you know they they process their own transactions, they batch their transactions, and like everything's basically settled via the the Drex kind of wholesale network. Um, probably not explaining that super well, but but the but the, the secret sauce here is that I mean wholesale CBDC isn't like a super or like novel concept at this point. They've, this idea has been around for a while. People have been working on this. But what's interesting is that they're they're building on Hyperledger Bazoo, right? Which is an Ethereum virtual machine compatible uh, permission chain. So the idea here is that all of these concepts that we've been witnessing in DeFi and in crypto. Uh, over the last few years, especially since, you know, 2020, kind of when the DeFi summer took off. So all of these things like, you know, decentralized like lending mechanisms and collateralization protocols like Maker or, uh, you know, lending pools, uh, liquidity pools, um, you know, decentralized exchanges, swapping functions, bridges, you know, all these types of things um, that have been kind of existing like, <clears throat> we'll say like kind of in the wild, I guess, or in, you know, just sort of, uh, you know, maybe perhaps just in the Wild West. Uh, the idea is like you can basically take these protocols, these contracts, and, you know, with minimal, you know, with, I mean, they're basically, it's interoperable, right? So you could, you could run these contracts within the direct environment, essentially. Um, so that's where it gets really interesting is that you have the ability to bring in a lot of these, a lot of what people have like really been building, a lot of the innovation that's been, just kind of, you know, just like almost like with like reckless abandon, people just been like building stuff, deploying stuff, and like we'll figure out what we're gonna use it for later, right? We're just like the, the idea is just like keep building, keep building, keep building, and but a lot of that stuff, okay, you're not gonna get like, serious liquidity behind some of these things until it's you know institutional friendly, right? And for something to be institutionally friendly, there needs to be a certain degree of kind of regulatory safeguards, a sense of maybe um, officialness, uh, quote unquote. Um, so op having these things operating within a central bank kind of, uh, uh, endorsed or supported environment, um, would presumably be more attractive to, you know, the institutional capital than, you know, than something that's, that's just operating on the wild west essentially. So I think, you know, and then liquidity begets liquidity, right? So if you can amass a certain amount of liquidity in, in, in this environment, you're going to be, continue to attract more liquidity, presumably. And then the, I guess the last point I would make on that is just that, especially now with like the SEC, looks like they're going to sue Uniswap now. Um, I have no idea what's going to happen with that, but it looks like it's going to happen. Um, so I would just suggest that it seems like the, the future of, 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 I guess we'll call it like unregulated DeFi, quote unquote, seems a bit like, like it's going to continue to exist, right? No, it's not going to get just shut down completely, but how much adoption will it actually have, I guess? Uh, in the years to come, if 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 there's you know, or it, it's, it's it's unclear how, to what extent like unregulated DeFi is going to be really like a kosher thing that people want to participate in. Uh, if you're if you're not like a like a DGen, basically. Well, so, it sounds like it's an institutional platform to really incentivize you to want to build your stuff on it, uh, especially if it's going to be interoperable. Well, that's the, that's the idea, right? Is that they can take, you know, you can you can basically take things that have already been built, you can redeploy them within the Drex environment, and uh, whether you're you're you know an individual builder, or whether you're a bank, or whether you're you know like an application or whatever you're building, the idea is that you can take these things and and redeploy them in a way that will that will, you know, you will presumably get a lot more scale out of deploying something like this in the Drex environment than you might in kind of like a Wild West unregulated environment. So, so would you anticipate an explosion of startups and innovators and builders once this thing is launched? I think, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the vision, I think. That's, that's what a lot of the builders and the VCs here are kind of gunning for. And it's 
a lot of, I think a lot of it right now is trying to communicate to like the rest of the world that like, Hey, this is happening here. This is really interesting. And I think, um, I think, you know, one of the, what we, one of the points I've been making to people is like, look guys, like this isn't the Marshall islands that's doing this. Like this is like a G20 country, right? <laughs> this isn't like some, I mean, we've seen these CBC experiments in other countries like the, you know, the Bahamas or like East Caribbean, you know, central bank or the like Marshall islands where they, they come up with some kind of, you know, you the can't bo- call that scale. Like the population basis. Yeah. Like and like, I mean, the aren't that and bad. it's like, a, these things like, you know, they haven't like really worked very well. And then B, um, you know, it's just like, even if it does work, like what, what do you, what can you really extrapolate? What lessons can you extrapolate from that? Like what's the, what, 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 are, what, are, what, what do the Bahamas and Brazil have in common? But I mean, right. I would also argue, what can't you make on a small island ge- with small ge- ge- geography and like five million people? Because if you look at Singapore, they can make anything work. Yeah, yeah, like the, yeah. But to exactly. make it work in a place like Brazil, where it's so large, diverse, high population, I mean, I think that's the real test case. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And if if it does work here, uh, and this this is this is really what you know where my bullish thesis, I guess, comes from is that if this does work. If they can pull off the central bank and execute what they say that they're you know trying to do, I I think this becomes the model that gets copied elsewhere by other countries, right? Because the, the the Drex specifically you know the Drex model is because every every central bank in the world is studying CBDCs right now. Like, well, how do we you know? Is, is Brazil in the the forefront? Like, where is there where are they on this? Who's the furthest ahead? Do you think? Well, I don't. I mean, I'm not sure who would. Well, China is probably the furthest ahead in terms of actual, like, deploying of these things, right? But that's not necessarily a model that we want to, like, replicate, yeah. right? So You don't want a social score? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. Uh, I would prefer not. I would prefer not. So, uh, so that's – so the thing is, like, CBDCs are going to be are going to be here no matter what, right? Like, as much as, you know, I personally am not, like, a huge fan of the concept, but, like – no one's asking for my opinion on whether we should deploy these things or not, right? Mm. Uh, they're coming regardless of whether you like it or not, right? Um, I guess the question is just going to be like, what kind of model do you want to deploy? Do you want like the Chinese surveillance state model? Do you want, um, do you, or do you do you want like you know just a straight you know retail type CBDC that's okay? We're just going to do away with the entire traditional banking system, and everybody, every consumer, just has an account direct with the Fed. And we get Fed bucks, you know, airdrop to us every week or whatever. And, that, you know, and then we, we just, you know, but like you could, I mean, that's something that would probably work, but you're a limit. You're basically like obviating a need for an exist, like the banking system, right? If, <laughs> if everybody just has account direct with the central bank, right? So what, what Brazil has found, and I think that was, that's what Brazil realized when they were first researching this is like, we want to do this, but how do we do this in a way that doesn't like, crush the existing financial system, right? How do you do this in a way that, that the existing banks and the existing financial system can actually benefit from some of this and like want to be a part of this innovation? It's not like just suffocating them. So they, they came up with this kind of hybrid retail wholesale CBDC model where, okay, you have the Drex, which is, you know, a, a digital real that, that this wholesale model that's, that circulate this currency that circulates within the, uh, the financial system or the regulated financial entities in the central bank. And then each bank will essentially be responsible for the deployment of its own like stable coins, right? So it'll basically be issuing like tokenized reals as to its customers, right? And and then they and the banks are the ones who are in charge of like building the applications and the wallets and the apps and all these kind of things. So the the whole kind of user experience part will be taken care of by the bank. So it's okay if you want to, you know, new bank is going to take a different approach than Itaú, then Itaú will have a different approach than uh, Brodesco, right? So, um, so I think this will, you know, this will offer a lot more, um, you know, choices and competition in the, in, in kind of a further democratization of the Brazilian financial system, which, you know, up until like 10, 15 years ago was pretty centralized. It was very much an oligopoly, like really controlled by four or five large banks that were, um, you know, it was, it was, it's like a textbook oligarchy, right? Mm-hmm. So that's why you had all these issues of, financial inclusion and you know you had like a quarter of the population unbanked because it just wasn't worth Itaú's time to go and you know onboard these customers and whatnot um so anyway so that's that's so i i think what where brazil really hit the nail on the head here is 
is finding a model that it's it's a, like a hybrid retail wholesale CBDC model that uh, stimulates competition and 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 uh, you know consumer choice in the financial system while also preserving and allowing the, the, the existing financial system to, to really be a part of this and thrive and benefit from it. Um, so I think if this, if this works, I think this is the model that will like ultimately be copied and replicated in other, other like similar sized countries, I think. Uh, in the same way that you're seeing, uh, for example, like PICS being copied, like Colombia is working on their own basically copycat version of PICS. Right now, you have other countries in the region and in the world generally that are looking at picks and how can we just like replicate that because it works, right? And I think, I think the direct system will, if it works, it will be, that's the model that I think a lot of countries are going to just kind of copycat and adopt for themselves. Hmm. Okay, that's, a, that's interesting. Um, but in terms of, I guess, so I guess we talked about the, the, the Drex, so let's talk about Bitcoin. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, I guess what is what is the perception of Bitcoin um, in Brazil? Is it being used a lot, utilized a lot, or is it is, is it just really the the crypto crew that are, are are more involved with it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Brazilians are they 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 really enjoy maybe maybe enjoy is the right word, but like Brazilians are very like they they like to kind of like roll the dice on investments, we'll put it that way, right? Um, so even things like I think like any any um, because like because like capital markets aren't like super deep here, right? So you don't have as an average kind of retail investor, you don't really have like a whole lot of things that you can invest money in, too, right? That will so you but you do have a lot of like fixed income products, and because interest rates are so high here, like the CELIC kind of uh, you know benchmark interest rate is you know it's you know above ten percent generally, um, you can make a pretty good return on just like fixed income products like double digit returns on fixed income kind of bonds and, 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 and debts and things like that. Um, but I think, but investing in like equities is not something that's like as popular as it is like in the U S right. So I think people are interested in, there's definitely an interest in, in, um, holding these types of assets that have much more of like an upside, but upside to them. Right. Um, you know, so, and, and the other thing too is like Brazilians are always like early adopters of new technology, right? Uh, Brazilians were using WhatsApp before you know any it became a thing worldwide. Uh, any kind of like consumer technology or you know sort of digital innovation, like Brazilians are always you know they're they're kind of like the beta test market for these things, right? Because they like they're very just savvy at using these types of things. I definitely think we're the opposite, <laughs> um, at least in Canada, from my point of view. I think the the biggest um, barrier that we have is adoption of technology, mm. Be, especially for this space, because the idea of having to have a wallet and having to you know remember your 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 code and the number I think that's it seems like a small thing, but I think it's a it's a barrier um, at least for uh, in Canada because yeah you know they don't mind the central ex- taking the the risk or depending on your perception of of the central exchanges holding everything. Well, and you guys also had, you know, the whole Gerald Cotton incident from a few years ago that, you know, wasn't exactly best, the great, well, great publicity know, for... Everybody gets their crypto <laughs> scandal, right? Right. <laughs> I'm still convinced that he's alive somewhere. I'm, 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 I'm in the, I'm in the, I'm in the tinfoil hat crowd of like, he faked his own death and he's living in like Warburg yeah, or something. Yeah, I mean, you know? I dying know. of chromes, he could have come up with something better. I mean, I think that was the year of Ebola, like... <laughs> you know, like it yeah, just he, seems chromes. Uh, oh, that's a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. I don't know. Like I'm, I. It's just. It seems like one of these things where it's like, I don't know. I don't know if I believe the official story on this, but whatever. I, I mean, I, I, I have no inside information, but I just like to speculate on these things. Um, uh, but yeah, but I think with with, with Brazil, I think it's interesting me that you have uh, a large adoption of. I mean, if you just take MetaMask, like MetaMask, there's a, Meta. Like Brazil is the second largest uh, market for MetaMask users uh, in the world after the U.S. So there's more MetaMask users in Brazil than in any other country except for the U.S. So what does that mean? Well, that means that, like, MetaMask is not necessarily, like, what you'd say, like, okay, this is something that your grandma can use, right? Like, this is more of, like, you're, you know, a serious kind of prosumer. Like, you're probably engaging in DeFi. You're probably buying NFTs. You're probably, you know, farming airdrops or whatever. You're, you're doing more than just, like, buying and holding Bitcoin, right? Um 
But you also have a lot of adoption through channels like Nubank, for example, or through Mercado Pago, which is uh, kind of the, the payments app of Mer Mercado Livre, uh, which is like the, you know, the Brazilian Amazon or the Latin American Amazon. Um, so you also have, you have a lot of adoption through these kind of centralized platforms where, you know, you know, kind of goes against the, you know, the crypto, like, you know, not your keys, not your coins type of thing. But like, the fact of the matter is like it's getting it I, I can go to my new bank app and i can buy bitcoin with just like two clicks right um and it's it's easy right it's super easy they, i mean they have more bitcoin they have like 15 different currencies Do they make there. it easy for you to transfer it into uh your own wallet no okay so <laughs> yeah so but I, I i think that's the progression of like fintechs offering bitcoin and these services always it usually starts or almost always starts with First, they enable the buying and selling, but they don't allow the transferring. That's what PayPal did. Um, and then eventually they end up, you know, onboarding uh, the, 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 the transferring features or the withdrawal features, right? Uh, whereas initially they start off with just buy and sell. I think there's just a lot of, I mean, there's probably some technical stuff involved. It's probably more just like the KYC and, and you know, that type of stuff that they don't want to necessarily have to deal with or some of the compliance requirements that, that make, make that feature a little bit more complex. Um, so it's easier for them just to have enable buying and selling, right? So, but that's how, that's kind of the progression, right? So like they, they launch it with just buy, sell, and then eventually they enable withdrawals, uh, or transference, transferring to another wallet. So, uh, I think one of the big platforms here now does now enable withdrawals. I can't quite remember, but it's, they've all said it's like on their roadmap, right? Or they, they plan to allow that eventually, um, but you have, like, for instance, like Nubank, I mean, they have 80 million customers here in Brazil. It's, it's, like, it's, it's like almost half the country that uses Nubank. Um, and in their app, you can, you know, like three clicks, you can go and buy Bitcoin, right? So when they first enabled Bitcoin in, you know, purchases in, I think it was summer of 2022, they had, they had like a million users or a million Bitcoin holders within like three weeks. So this is like massive, massive adoption. They also New, New Bank also has their own loyalty token. They have a new coin. It's called New Coin, like a loyalty coin <laughs> that you earn. It's like a polygon-based thing that you actually earn um, for you know doing various. I'm not sure exactly what how you earn it, but there's you know having a balance or you know holding crypto or whatever. But it's like a loyalty coin, and they have. Last time they reported the numbers on that, I think it was like 14 million people that have new coins in their wallet now. Which, uh, which like like globally, that's that's probably the largest tokenized loyalty experiment that you'll see anywhere. Yeah, I mean the, I mean I love the idea of tokens. I just don't understand why it's so hard for people to understand, because it's not it's not really anything that new. It's a loyalty reward program for whatever business or whatnot, but it's using blockchain, so it has some extra features. Yeah. But like the difference between the the, the web one we'll call it or, or non web loyalty reward programs is that you weren't really rewarded. Yeah. You know? Right. Whereas like with, with tokens and I mean yes, there's there's other things you can do with it as well, but a lot of the use case described as I uh, was on stage uh, yesterday is it's essentially just a loyalty rewards program that benefit the builders and the users more so than the middlemen that don't really add to the ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, and and, uh, and you're just referencing this this Yatsu conversation that I, I had on stage yesterday. Who's and, and Yatsu from Animoca? He's really one of these guys that's when you hear him talking about like just Web three, the web role of like Web three and tokens and branding and like just customer engagement and things. You're like, wow, like it's, it's kind of a red pill experience. Just even like talking to the guy about or listening to him talk about this, right? Because um, it's his whole. I mean, I was actually having a conversation with him backstage before the panel. That was like. It was, it was frankly like a lot more interesting than the conversation we had on stage, which was unfortunate. <laughs> I was like trying to, I was like, I tried to recreate the backstage pre-conversation on stage. But I, I was, we were going into, we were going into meme coins, right? So I was asking them, you know, meme coins are kind of these like controversial thing, right? People are like, oh, it's, it's just this, you know, lots of like just pump and dumps and kind of crazy stuff and Trump coins and, you know, all these kind of weird things. And, and his whole point was like, look, I think meme coins are getting a really bad rap here. I think at the end of the day, it's just like, it's tokenization of, of culture, right? And like everything, like even like Bitcoin, you could argue is a meme coin, right? It started off as, uh, you know, er, like the early days of Bitcoin were characterized by like, it's, it's a meme. It's like, 
you're this like anti-state like libertarian you know type you're you're you know you want you want to buy drugs on the internet or you're whatever you're like at the end of the day it's like everything would be kind of comes it's like a tokenization of of culture is almost what he was for how he was framing it i mean i'm not i'm not doing doing justice here but um but the way he was framing it was like okay these these are ways that consumers can really it's not even just like a necessarily like a loyalty it's not like okay like i spent you know a hundred dollars i get two coins back that are worth a dollar each that I can, it's not it's not just a cash back thing or like a you know air miles thing or uh, it's just some percentage rate but it's like you're an active stakeholder in this world of like you know whatever the ecosystem is by owning these tokens and there's there's even if like there's no value other than the fact that you get to own like the Dogecoin and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm a Dogecoin enthusiast now because I'm a part of this, right? Well, this is like me. I, I buy stuff every four years just to be part of it. Right. <laughs> you know, like I don't have any actual goal, but it's just like, oh, this is exciting. And I want to be part of it. That's how I kind of started. I didn't actually start to try to, to make money or, or to think that it's going to change the financial system. It was just like, oh, this is cool. And yeah, like it like, looks interesting. Yeah. And like there's like the, my friends are all buying Bitcoin and they're talking about it. So maybe I should, you know, maybe I should get some too, right? Or, and I think some of this is what like, I mean, that's how Dogecoin basically, I mean, Dogecoin, if you, if you think about, I mean, not to like totally divert the theme of this conversation to Dogecoin, <laughs> but like if you think of like Dogecoin is fascinating because like it's a, it, this is literally a coin that was created to show that like crypto is stupid, right? Like that was the, the that was the whole intention of creating this thing. Like the guy, uh, forgetting his name, but the guy who created Dogecoin, he's like, I'm creating this just to show that like crypto sucks and it's stupid. Like I'm creating it as a joke. It's like just supposed to show how dumb this whole thing is. And it's like, what's the market cap? I mean, that was ten years ago. It's the ultimate right? troll. It, yeah, <laughs> that was that was ten years ago, and it's like Dogecoin has been consistently in the top ten yeah. uh, of of like market cap since like since then, right? And people keep buying it, and like Elon Musk comes and promotes it, and like you know every cycle. I mean, it's like, you know, now you can. And now it's basically like it's a blue chip meme coin, right? It's it's like okay, if you have your meme coin portfolio, you have your blue chips now, like your Doge and your Shib and your Bonk, and then you have, you know, your Trump coin, and you have your, you know, I bought some Winnie the Pooh coins the other day because you know I like Winnie the Pooh. I was a big Winnie the Pooh fan when I was a kid, so I saw a Pooh meme coins. So I bought some of that. Um, maybe investment advice. I don't know. I don't know if it's going to go up or not, but. Um, but anyway, but these are things that like, since then, like so much investing for. I mean, going back to like the, the the you know the bell curve meme, right? Where it's like you have like the midwit guy who's like, oh my gosh, I can't understand the value proposition of meme coins, like whatever. And then you have the you know the low IQ guy who's just like, just just buy the coin, and like the high IQ guy who's like, just buy it. You know, like so much of investing is uh, is you know as much as we try to make it like, or like, the way that most people invest is really like it's you're 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 thinking about just it's just a cultural thing it's like a it's like there's a cultural influence on you whether it's friends or whether it's like influencers or whether it's um um just you're like hey like this seems like a thing that i should learn about because other people are doing it and it looks interesting and that's how people end up getting i mean that's how a lot of people end up just buying stocks too right if you're if you're just a retail stock trader you're like oh like my dad works at general electric so maybe i should buy some general electric you know so I think you know, to maybe tying this all back to Brazil, like Brazil's very, it's a very like affinity, you know, affinity network driven culture. Right? I think all, all Latin and Latin cultures are probably like that. And I think that's some, some of that stems from the fact that, I mean, you have like very strong familial and like friendship bonds. Um, and some, a lot of that arises from the fact that, you know, the, you know, the governmental institutions are perhaps not like super trustworthy a lot of times, right? So you have to kind of create these alternate systems of trust because it's like, well, I can't necessarily trust the government. So like, let's create our own familial network here, whether it's like a church or like a social thing or whatever it might be, right? So I think um, tying that all back back in, I think that is how a lot of uh, Brazilians end up entering into the world of crypto is because um, because like you know somebody in their affinity network is like is in, is is involved in this in some capacity right um so if you look at if you go to coin gecko and you look at okay who what are the top coins that are being searched from brazilian ip addresses they actually i mean they actually break this out and it's like all these like random like meme coins and like game fight coins that like never heard of before right be, like bitcoin and then it'll be like crypto cars parade or so it was just like all these random things like i've never even heard of any of this stuff before 
But apparently these things are be, are really popular in, you know, Brazilian telegram groups or just people going around promoting this stuff, right? Um, so anyway, so the, the point being is like the, the culture here is very, um, uh, how do you say it? It's people are very like, people will, will, will kind of follow along with what like, you know, their friends are doing or what their people in their affinity networks are, are doing or what, what they're telling them to do or are suggesting. And, um, and that can be a good thing and a bad thing, right? Uh, it can be good because it's like, Hey, like you should, you know, we should really encourage people to like buy more Bitcoin. Like it's a, it's a great way of saving. It's a great way to, even if you only put like hundred ray ice a month away in this, like this is probably a good thing to, to preserve capital for long term. It can also be really bad in the sense that that's, you know, you see a lot, we've, we've had a lot of like really just nasty, like pyramid scheme cases here over the years where it's people taking advantage of these affinity networks, like going into like churches and just start, you know, kind of selling their pyramid scheme, getting people like, you know, church grandmas to like invest their money into these things. And then the guy just like funnels the money off and he disappears kind of thing. So you have a lot of stuff like that. That's been unfortunate. And that's really been a, a pretty significant hurdle to adoption here. Um, it's cause some of these, these aren't just like, like cheesy, like Nigerian prints, like scams. These mm-hmm. are, a lot of these schemes are where like, you've got like the local like, congressman involved and like the local mayor and these guys are all like in on it. You know, it's like, it's like massive, massive schemes. Right. Um, so, but now there's a new law in the books that has really trying to kind of clean some of that stuff up. There's like higher penalties for people who get caught using, um, you know, crypto for, for illicit activity and this kind of stuff or like financial scams. Um, and now with regulation coming in later this year, which is another thing that we should probably be talking about, um, you know, we'll have regul- regulation coming from the central bank for, for VASP crypto exchanges uh, in the second half of this year, which, uh, which will open up like a licensing process for VASP to be licensed and really put in finally some firm rules around what our, um, you know, so still working through things like, you know, asset segregation and things like that. Uh, but putting in kind of like the, the bread and butter building blocks of a, of a crypto regulatory framework here that will really fully define um, what is the... And I think once once that happens, um, I think that kind of opens the floodgates for a lot more, you know, capital to really enter the market here just because you will have like... It will be like an officially like regulated space, right? It's not just kind of a speculative thing. And like we're right now we're in the speculative phase where it's like, we know it will be regulated, but we're not like quite there yet, right? But everyone knows it's kind of coming, so... People are just kind of positioning themselves for that right now. Yeah, we've, I mean, I still think we have a long ways to go for regulation um, in Canada as well. I mean, we've, we've had some successes recently uh, with Coinbase getting the, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, open restriction, I think is what it's called. Forget the name, but they, they just uh, right. announced it. So, oh, sorry, uh, was it open restriction dealer? I think that's what it is, what it's termed in Canada. So, okay. So that was like a big win, but even so, outside of that, um, there's still a lot of, I'd say, complexity um, in in the space. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a tough question, right? It's, uh, I mean, I think every every jurisdiction is kind of wrestling with this a little bit differently. Like the U.S. is obviously kind of its own, you know, has its own problems at the moment. Um, Brazil seems to be on the right path, right? Like it 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 seems that that the the approach that the central bank is taking is People in the industry seem to be very supportive of it, right? They, they, they. I think the central bank's been very consultative with the industry. They're like, you know, they're actually they actually put out like a public consultation of, you know, something like thirty questions to the public uh, late last year with a bunch of, you know, they're like, which is something they don't normally do, right? Uh, they send out a list of thirty questions to the market, saying like, okay, these are some problems that we have. Use some questions that we have. How, what do you suggest we do? Like, how, what do we do? How do we deal with this asset segregation issue? Like, how do we, you know, kind of the post FTX, you know, you know, segregation of customer funds and, and, and uh, company funds. Like, how do you propose we solve this problem? Like, we don't know. Like, you guys tell us. What do you think is the best solution? So they've been very consultative in this regard, which I think a lot of, a lot of companies found to be pretty refreshing because that's not necessarily how it works, you know, in the U.S. or you know, other places, for example. So it seems like... All indications are that they're 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 kind of going in the right direction, uh, in a positive direction. And uh, you know the CVM, the the SEC here has also been quite open um, to, you know, uh, 
you know, kind of asset tokenization. They they understand the concept of like of like tokenized assets, and they want it. They're, they've 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 created a sandbox that's that's allowed some interesting tokenization projects um, to be deployed. Uh, you know, not necessarily at scale, but at least within the sandbox. Uh, but they've also expressed like, look, like we see this stuff as the future, but we're just kind of trying to figure out how to, you know, we don't want this stuff to get like you know, just totally go off the rails, but we want to, we want to be able to support, you know, support the growth of this. They see this stuff as the future, right? It's not, they're not, they don't see this stuff as the enemy. I think that's the important thing, right? I, I don't think for, again, I'm just speaking from my point of view, but I don't think Canada views it as the future. It views it as something that's emerging in the market that they need to regulate. Um, I think the difference is, is because of, and I would probably credit Coinbase to it, um, getting the conversation going, at least the government will have the conversation and will at least show up to some of the yeah. events and activities. You know, I just kind of wish it wasn't mostly the tax, the tax people, but, you know, like... <laughs> right, right. But, I mean, there, there's... there's I'm just making a side joke there, but, I mean, there, there's, <laughs> there's others as well. Uh, but I think the restricted uh, dealer um, designation that uh, Coinbase got, I think that was, was a pretty big win. So I think we're heading in that direction, but just the nature of... of of Canada will always, in my opinion, be dictated by what happens in the South. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think, I, I think with what's interesting is that you have um, some of these, you know, merging market countries. You want to call them that? Like they, they have the They see this stuff as an opportunity, maybe like leapfrog, right? Where the U.S. and Canada, maybe the more developed markets, they see this stuff as it's just kind of like a nuisance, right? Like this is just annoying crypto casino stuff, and can we just get rid of it? You know. Where, you know, here, I think in Brazil, it's like you see this as, they say this like, hey, this is an opportunity for us to like really leapfrog and really advance and really improve the, improve the system here, improve the lives of the population here. Uh, it's not just like this annoying thing that we got to deal with now, right? Where, yeah, I think we kind of have the, you know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Yeah. And yeah. like the perception is that it's not broken. Maybe it is, maybe it's not, yeah. but it hasn't really caused any significant pain. Uh, I would say in terms of the long term scheme of things that I think that's why it's harder to introduce. Whereas like yeah. here, you know, there's, there's been, you know, it's a different, it's different dynamics of the, the institutions here. So yeah. I put it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think, I, I think with, you know, a country like Canada, I don't know, I guess I don't know a whole lot about the, the Canadian, I know it's, it's the securities laws there. It's more of like a provincial based thing. It's not, there's not like a national securities regulator. Yeah. It's more like issued on the provincial level. Um, and I know there's been, you know, some, I think every, every province can kind of take their own, their own, um, view on how they, you know, what's a security and what's not a security and that type of thing. But, um, but Canada, I mean, I mean, like Canada's is, I mean, they've got it like, I mean, there's, I feel like Canada has like the ingredients to be, to be successful in with this if they, if they want it, you know what I mean? Uh, again, we kind of chased out the people doing that it's like you know like I mean, like or we they, had, or we they had, fake their own deaths and you know like got, we, like know. like we, ethereum was it came out yeah, of canada yeah yeah um, and yeah. you know some of the web3 uh, crowd that i talked to that's in the space their businesses are still registered abroad because they can't they can't do it uh, in canada and it's not that they're doing anything that's not that's not above board it's just the regulatory framework isn't there in order to be able to register it yeah, and yeah. like even even getting a bank account, if you're doing anything crypto, like if you're doing a business that's intended to be DeFi and you're going to be working with crypto, that, that's also another challenge. So I don't think the challenge is necessarily like that these guys aren't building products and that they they aren't well and that they're just trying to avoid taxes. I think what it is is that there's no regulatory clarity, and so yeah. they don't until that happens, they can't bring it back. Yeah, yeah. Right? And I think I think it, this is one of these cases where Canada's like close association with the U.S. I mean, obviously, is good in a lot of ways, but this might be one of the, this might be a bit of an Achilles heel, right? Because Canada doesn't want to get too far, doesn't want to diverge too far from what the U.S. is doing on these things, right? I think it's probably at least that's how I would see it as like an outsider. For sure, I was at I was at an event, and I'm probably butchering everything I'm about to say, but. We've had uh, we've had ETFs for crypto in Canada for a while. Yeah, like two three years now, right? And you know, I saw a slide where TD Bank is advertising selling to Canadian market, but from the U.S. TD Bank, oh, really? not the Canadian TD Bank, <laughs> which they won't touch it or, or or do any of that. Yeah, at least from the way that this was presented, which is like weird because the guys is like, why are we allowing like the U.S. financial institutions 
to sell to our market when we can't sell to our own because there's so many restrictions and, and there's not enough clarity on regulation. And again, I'm butchering it, but uh, the way he explained it, I thought that was like, that was insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like, well, yeah, it's 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 like, I mean, it's kind of it's a clever arbitrage play, I guess. Yeah. We're like, hey, let's just go sell this stuff in Canada if we can't do it here, right? Um, and I think, I, I mean, there's even, um, I mean, I talked to a couple, uh, uh, a couple months ago, I was talking to some Canadian auditors, and they were, they had a project where they were auditing, they're doing auditing on some, you know, some type of ETF or ETP or something. Um, I don't remember exactly what it was, but. But they were basically like, they were kind of seeing, because in the U.S. you've had a, kind of a crackdown, part of the crypto crackdown has been discouraging, quote unquote, like, you know, auditors from like working on these projects, right? So like they call up like EY and be like, don't you dare touch these crypto things, right? Like you're trying to kind of just squeeze the life out of crypto, right? So a lot of, so it's, it's hard for these projects to find like, you know, auditors who will, you know, work on these projects, right? So these guys in Canada were like, hey, maybe there's like a niche here where if, you know, for we're, we're Canada, we're not like subject to like Elizabeth Warren, you know, sending us letters and stuff. So maybe we have an opportunity to maybe provide some of these services that uh, wouldn't otherwise, other people are getting squeezed out of essentially. Um, so anyway, I mean, I think there's, you know, it seems like there's a, there's an interesting opportunity there. For well, I mean, the, the tax department offered voluntary audits for anyone who was unclear about regulation. Oh, really? <laughs> Uh, but uh, we're we're coming up to the, to the last few minutes here, so uh, this is kind of like where we just switch to to the fun questions. Okay, great. So, um, are you currently reading or listening to anything um, interesting at the moment? Um, so I'm I'm almost done with this Michael Lewis Sam Bankman Fried book, uh, the highly controversial uh, Michael Lewis book on Sam Bankman Fried, where he presents Sam Bankman Fried as this you know this sort of heroic figure or whatever um it was it wasn't like as i mean he it, it it wasn't like as bad as i was kind of expecting it to be i mean he he does he he doesn't he doesn't you know portray sbf as a villain just he portrays him as kind of this so like just just for anyone who might not know what oh right what we're, we're talking oh so about. like so michael so the sam bankman freed uh probably know who he is but michael lewis the the you know the famous author uh like flash boys and whatever else uh, he wrote, you know, he spent a lot of time accompanying Sam Bankman Freed, and he was, you know, even before the crash, he was writing this book about Sam Bankman Freed, and it, it came out, like, he, they released it, like, right around the trial, I think, last year, and it, it came out with this very, um, I think it got, it took a lot of criticism for painting Sam in a very, you know, positive light that is, you know, I guess... If the book would have been written a year later, it would probably have had a di much different vibe to it. I think that was the that was the criticism. Like they didn't focus enough on like they talk a lot about Sam's like personal life and his upbringing and how he, uh, you know, how he's kind of like this kind of weird loner kid at school with a rolling backpack and you know all these things and he you know, and that. But they don't really talk anything about like the fraud and you know. Well, <laughs> the best the best it. villains you have to empathize with. So <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that is true. So, but anyway, I'm, I'm reading that. It's actually. Um, I mean, it's, I mean, it's enlightening because you learn, I guess, you know, you learn a lot. Like, I learned a lot about Sam. Um, I mean, I've actually, like, I've met Sam a few times back in his pre-villain days, mm -hmm. you know, so, like, just found him to be just, okay, this guy seems to be pretty smart, but I'm not really entirely sure how he's running this, like, massive crypto exchange, but, you know, he seems like a intelligent mm -hmm. kid, but, like, so it's kind of, so I've been, I've been kind of gorging on some of this Sam Bagman freed stuff lately. Um, I don't know, it, it's, it just feels like, I feel like there's still a lot more to the story that we haven't learned yet. Is is sort of my take on There'll it. There'll be a couple of books. I think like there's a lot there's a lot out there that will be revealed. I don't know what it is. I'm just I just have this hunch that there's a lot more that like we haven't been told about to the story. Is sort of my take on it. Okay, cool. Um, of course, this is still the the year of AI, so I gotta ask. Yes, absolutely. What's your uh, favorite AI tool that you're using or playing with, or that you find interesting? Um, so I've been using I've been using a lot the Claude, the new Anthropic uh, kind of Chat GBT like competitor okay. um, that Sam Bankman Fried also invested in. <laughs> <laughs> I guess bring it back full circle. Um, I just found it to be a uh, I found it actually a lot more useful than ChatGPT. I feel like ChatGPT just keeps getting progressively dumber and like less useful. Rude but, too. Yeah, yeah, rude. Yeah, and just like and just generally like unhelpful. You know, you ask it a question and 
it's like okay, I don't need a lecture about like the you know the the the, the like the various competing points of view on this. I just need like the answer to the question, right? Um, but like anthropic or the the Claude model is a lot more. It, it just sort of like reasons a bit better. So I can I can take you know like when I do a podcast, for example, I'll take the the transcript of the podcast and I just dump it into Claude and be like create a 500 word blog post summarizing this episode with like highlights and bullet points and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, you know, it's like 70, 80% usable, right? Which is pretty good, right? So I'll go in and kind of edit up, clean out the rest of it, make it sound like an AI didn't write it. Um, but it's like with, with ChatGPT, it's, it's just like, it's just unusable in my opinion. I, I have to just rewrite the whole thing. Um, so I've been using that a lot. I found it, I found it to be a lot more, um, like it, it feels more like ChatGPT in the early days before mm -hmm. they started like putting the brakes on it. If you know what yeah, I mean? Okay. Yeah. So I've been using that a lot. I've been using, um, um, I also use these like AI, these like, you know, kind of AI clip, like video clip generators, right? Yeah. You, you plug, you drop a YouTube video in there and it spits out like 20 clips and you go in and, um, you know, it's, I mean, this stuff is, this stuff is, you know, these things aren't like, there's still like a lot of room for improvement with these tools, but, uh, you know, for life as like a content creator, it definitely makes your life a lot easier. And, you know, you can, you know, I'm probably doing the work of like five people, like just myself, <laughs> like we use, you know, using these tools. So it's, it's definitely a productivity enhancer for sure. So is there a productivity tool you can't live without? Oh man. Um, Are they all AI tools now? Yeah, they're all kind of AI <laughs> tools really. I mean, I'm, I'm honestly, I, I probably need to get better at using these productivity tools. Like, uh, that's kind of my, my downfall is like personal organization and like optimizing productivity, you know, like I wish I could be one of those guys that has like his whole life organized in notion or something, but like, it's, <laughs> I just, it's like, it's so hard for me to, to do that. But I mean, I do use notion a lot, but I'm, it's probably my main productivity tool, but I'm, I have no like loyalty to it. It's just, oh, it's just okay. like, it's, it just works. So I'm like, all right, this is good enough. So <laughs> what about you? What, what's your, what's your hack? My mind's so low key. It's it's really just my calendar. Oh, <laughs> all right. Well, <laughs> you know, that's, like that's without, a tool, like right? without the calendar, I just uh, I wouldn't be able. I would never be on time to anything. I would miss <laughs> everything. Like I, it's really just it's so basic. But just having a calendar that's easily able to plug into everything. Without yeah. that, I wouldn't get anything done. <laughs> uh, pretty much, yeah, I would yeah. be chaotic. I would have notes here, emails here, be looking at everything, and it's. Yeah. It's very simple, but it. Yeah. I, How do you? I mean, do you do you have like your entire day structured in your calendar, or you just have like meetings? Everything's st structured in there. Like, so you have yes, like, like I have meetings, but I have like, I also have like group work. I have different events I got to go to. I have uh, reminders in there. Like, I have all, all kinds. Or do you of program stuff. out like okay from you know. 8.30 to 9, I'm going to, like, check emails. And, like, 9 to 9.30, I'm going to, like, read the So I don't, I don't do it like that. It's just really more of, like, I just have too many too many different projects, too many different people that I, I have to engage with. Okay. So I also create recurring uh, meetings through different days of the week got so it, that I know, it. like, I'm going to come back to that. So I'm not really pre-programming anything. Like, on Sundays, I'm not building my week calendar. Okay. No, I create blocks uh, for recurring meetings and stuff, and then everything else that like ties into it. Got it. Got it. Um, so, yeah, it's it's not it's not it's still like it's still like a little bit low key, but yeah. but it works until like maybe an, an AI can be smart enough to be a personal assistant that puts it all in the calendar yeah. for me um, to be managed. Yeah, yeah. Well, I feel like like I have to try to like my my current hack for this is trying to fill up my calendar with. Even if it's like I don't have meetings, but it's just like okay, from you know here's for this two hour block you're gonna focus on emails or you know you're gonna focus on uh, you know grinding on social media or whatever, working on clips kind of thing. Um, and if I if I don't have that, like it's easy to just like punt stuff. So it's like you know like a, it's, it's like if I don't have if I don't have like a full calendar. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna wake up early. I'm gonna be like, yeah, I'm not gonna go to the gym this morning. I'll just go after lunch. You know what I mean? Yeah. But if I have like a full calendar, it's like, okay, no, I have to go to the gym right now because I have no time later. Yeah, so that's, that's a good strategy you know actually I mean? for the so, gym. <laughs> so it's like, if the calendar is full, like my likelihood of going to the gym in the morning is much higher. So that's kind of the approach I've been taking, but um, with reasonable success. But yeah, cool. We'll see. <laughs> so uh, last question. Um, just this is more of like uh, I guess a uh, career related uh, question or or what uh, industry and what you're doing is uh, 
If you could go back in time and give yourself advice about the industry, what would it be other than buy lots of Bitcoin? <laughs> about, about crypto specifically, I mean? Uh, in general. Or in just in general. Yeah. You know, I mean, I wish I would have, you know, honestly, I wish I would not have um, moved to Washington, D.C. out of college. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's maybe my main thing. Yeah, I, wanted to, I had to kind of like, oh, I want to change the world, and that's where all the nonprofits are, and, you know, government people that do all these noble things or whatever and then i you know i feel like i like boxed myself in way too much um you know trying to play this kind of because i realized quickly that once you live in dc for a certain period of time like you develop a professional skill set that's only applicable in washington dc mm. so it's like okay you're good at nonprofit administration or you're like you know government bureaucrat stuff or you're a uh you know a government affairs director it's like well we're you gonna do run state government affairs in ohio or something that's like kind of a downgrade you know um, so that was probably my main thing was that was probably not like a very smart, like career decision, I guess, in retrospect, even though I liked living there, I learned a lot, but it was like, it opens a lot of doors and you meet a lot of interesting people. But as far as like, I ended up developing a skill set that wasn't like, that wasn't really like any use outside of Washington, DC. So <laughs> that makes sense. But okay, like, I mean, so crypto kind of liberated me from that. You know, so I, I, I'm very like thankful to crypto that I was able to you know, I work remote now, and I'm you know I can do all I can just do things kind of worldwide. And but there was a period there where I was, I was like, you know, in that you know kind of 2014 to 2016 window, I was like, okay, like how do I get out of here? <laughs> okay, so choose a geographical market where you can have transferable skills. Well, I mean, I guess like if you I mean, if your skills are. I mean, I guess it's going to depend on, I mean, every market's going to have its own. Yeah. I mean, if you live in, you know, Houston, like your, if your skill set is like an energy or something, then, you know, like you're probably not going to have, if you move to like Minneapolis, like that skill set might not necessarily transfer over, I guess. But, um, but I think like just with like politics specifically, like, like there's just nowhere else you can take those skills from Washington unless you want to be like running political campaigns or something, or unless you want to be like a state legislative affairs director, which would be a pretty serious like downgrade in terms of salary and, you know, prestige and all that stuff. Um, so it was, it was a bit of a trap, I guess that I, like I, it opened, it was like a really cool opportunity, but you know, you got to have like an exit strategy, I guess. Is maybe, oh, the, okay. maybe the point I'm trying to make is like, you have to figure out what your exit strategy is, right? Um, like, how do you get out of there? Because you don't want to be stuck in, like, Washington, D.C. your whole life because it's kind of soul-sucking, to be honest. I mean, it's a nice place to live, but it's just, like, it's kind of soul-sucking. <laughs> <laughs> well, you live, in a, you live in a capital city, too, right? So, yeah. you, know, you, know, you know how it is, right? Uh, probably not as, quite as severe as, as D.C., but, like, you got to have an exit strategy. For yeah, no, you can feel it. I've been to D.C. before. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It has it's, a different atmosphere, for it sure. It does, it does, it does. So, um, but I love D.C. I met my wife, D.C., lived there for about 10 years, um, you know, it was really, it was a really cool experience, like moving there out of college and you know, first time I was like living on my own, you know, it was in DC, um, you know, got robbed a few times, you know, school hard knocks sort of stuff, but you know, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun there. Uh, won't forget, uh, was it DuPont square? I think it's where everybody went for happy hour. Yeah. Yeah. DuPont. Yeah. yeah. DuPont. And then, uh, I actually had, uh, on the weekends I, I had a job as a pedicab driver, like little bike taxis, okay. which was Probably the best job I've ever had, honestly. Like, you just get paid to, you just, like, ride bike and, like, it's, give people rides, just hang out, you know, it's always, get a nice tan. It's always yeah. funny how everyone talks about the best job they had is, like, usually, like, the most basic job. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so, uh, that's all the questions that I have. So, before we wrap up, is there anything that you would like to promote or announce coming up with any of your projects? Um. Yeah, I, mean, I would just say check out Brazil Crypto Report if you're interested in learning more about, about the market here. Um, you know, I'm, I produce a newsletter every week. I produce a podcast every week where I'm just trying to showcase what's happening in the ecosystem. So I um, would definitely uh, just encourage folks to check that out. Um, do most of the content in English, so it's, it's, you know, it's gringo-friendly, specifically, uh, intentionally. And, um, yeah, I mean, I I'm, I'm appreciate the invitation. Uh, it's nice to, you know... It's, fun. it's kind of weird being on the other side of the mic. You know, I'm usually the one asking the questions, so it's kind of it's nice to be able to like, editorialize a bit uh, on the other side here. So I uh, appreciate the invitation, and, uh, yeah, look forward to doing this again sometime. Yeah, no, it's great to have you. Thanks for doing this. Awesome. Thank you. Cool.
You can find information about the Candid Capital podcast on the website, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Episodes can be found on Spotify and other podcast platforms. A quick reminder that this is infotainment and is not intended to be professional advice, malicious, or hateful. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not represent those of employers, partners, and their subsequent connected private and public associations or organizations. We canned it, I hope you understand it. Your business broke, we planned it, yeah. This ain't for show, we stamped it, yeah. Yeah, no FOMO, everyone come join, no solo. This all factual, from me to you, this candid capital.